discuss various issues around equality, diversity, and inclusion. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, do each of you want to take us in turn to give a brief minute introducing yourself, what you, you do, and how you have kind of gotten to where you are today? Yeah. Hello. Hi, I'm Ying. Um, I did my undergraduate at the University of Glasgow, where I did my research on ultrasonic uh, drill for space applications. I later completed a master's at the University of Cambridge, where I also did the research on technology intelligence and published it uh, as a first author um, in, in the academic journal. Later, I've, I've co founded a startup and I've worked in a startup before I joined Rolls Royce as a manufacturing engineer. My name is Carmen. Um, I'm currently one of the co-founders and the CEO of New Quantum, which is a spin-up company shop. Um, I studied physics at the College and then went to Cambridge with a, a ETC, nanotechnology ETC, and then joined Metal um, Dose with Quantum Optics with a postdoc there. And, and one of the, the things I worked on led to uh, a patent which has led now to Heard from me already, but I'm Ruth Olsen. I'm a professor of quantum photonics. I took a traditional academic route, I guess. I did a PhD in um, Sheffield on, on semiconductor quantum dots, and I did a postdoc in um, Germany. And, and after a brief spell coming back to Sheffield, I um, got a fellowship and a tenured position at Bristol University. Um, I'm Anna Seddon, I'm an Associate Professor of Physics in the University of Bristol and uh, Director of one of the other CDTs in the University of Bristol, BCFM, and I've got a terrible confession to make, I'm a chemist, <laughs> um, but I'm better now. So um, I actually did my PhD in Bristol in the School of Chemistry um, and then did a postdoc in uh, Molecular Biology. Um, because it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, I then actually went and uh, got a fellowship straight out of my postdoc. I went to the University of Chicago, worked in the biophysics department, and then sort of came full circle back to the University of Bristol, and I'm now happily where I belong in physics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you for that. Um, I do think we've also got a roaming mic around, so if anyone does want to ask questions at any point, feel free to put your hand up and we will bring the mic to you. So with that in mind, let's get started on our first question, which is, for people with experience both in industry and in academia, are there any big differences you've noticed in how women are treated or how they behave in the two field areas? Um, yeah, we'll start from, uh, from the industry. I think we had a little chat before um, the session today, and I think there are a very big chunk of uh, common themes of how women are treated. And um, also, you know, reflecting on the presentation we've just seen, it is the same. So I'll, I'll name a few. So for example, where um, a woman uh, asks a question and they have not been looked at when the answer is being given, um, they were looked at other men who seems more senior, for example, so that's one of the assumptions people made. Um, women sometimes get uh, interrupted uh, more than men, and that's the stats and research behind that, even at the CEO level. Um, and, well, like say, sexual harassment, things like um, being touched at, you know, being made uh, comments, banters that might not be appropriate at work. So I think these things are common um, across different areas, whether it is industry or academia, I think. But I'd say I, I would be more um, optimistic perhaps about industry in, a, in the sense that there's more, um, there's more care around management and HR. Uh, you know, policies are, can be implemented in a more rigorous way, whereas my, my fear with academia is that um, largely recruitment, support, management is, is left to um, who don't receive any, any training uh, on that. So I think that's that's the kind of main risk of of, of the structure of academia. 
Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a, a quick comment, not about the industry, but the weather we get training. We do get some training, um, probably not enough, but I think that the way academics are, they like to not be told what to do um, and therefore ignore this kind of training and run the groups the way they want. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the demographic of, of, of departments um, will depend on Do we have any comments from, so a number of people in this audience as well have careers that have spanned both academia and industry, do we have any comments from those people? Yes. Um, I have more of a question. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of hard to find actual statistics online. Um, and you did a, a wonderful study, Ruth. I was just wondering if, um, if you were extending that through to industry, if the drop that you see from kind of postdoc to senior academic is similar to the drop to industry, or if it's much, much, much lower to industry, because that's uh, what I'd say my experience of industry was. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, first of all, there is a lack of statistics, one of the problems we face is a lack of statistics, but there is a, like the McKinsey study is a very thorough and very widespread study, but actually what they find is that that drop off is very consistent across all sectors. And actually, even if you look at female dominated sectors that are at entry level, you still get a drop off. So you get more, let's say, CEOs who are women, but your chances, um, I took that data and actually calculated it, your chances of going from entry level to CEO are approximately the, the same whether you're in, in an engineering or physics or um, male dominated subject or let's say healthcare or something, female dominated subject, um, rather surprisingly. So there are, are more numbers of women at CEO suite for, for, um, for um, female dominated areas, but, but the chances are the same, actually. So it's, it's common across the board. My experience is that people assume you're younger than you are if you're a woman because they, they're not used to seeing seeing women. So I think it, it's, it kind of goes hand in hand. I was I was at a, a Royal Society meeting a few months ago where somebody asked me if I was a PhD student. I said no. I'm 42. I'm a professor and I've been running my group for the past 10 years. So yeah, I haven't had it for that for a while, but that used to happen to me all the time. Actually, there's assumptions being made about you. Uh, my experience in you know, was such a long time ago that I'm not sure my memory is that reliable, to be, to be honest. But I would back up what Ruth said, this idea that um, there is there is an age characteristic to it in the fact that, so my postdoc supervisor, was in, she was an absolutely phenomenal scientist, very, very young. So she, she ended up in a first permanent position at the age of about 26. And the number of times people said to her, and who's your supervisor? And she's there going, I wrote the textbook, I wrote the papers that you're citing. And they just couldn't get their heads around the fact that this woman uh, at this young age had been so amazing. But if she was a bloke, she would have just been ambitious. So what are your what are your views on positive discrimination programs? Just because it is good at encouraging women to go into STEM, but sometimes it feels like it's um, detrimental because people look at you and they think well you only got in because you're a woman so it takes away from your academic achievements so I was just wondering what your so the way the way I look at it it's it's not about positive discrimination necessarily it's about if you've got three equally qualified candidates and two of them are men and one of them's a woman you have to ask yourself why would I pick this man instead of this woman 
all other things being equal. And I think it's more for me, it's about challenging the expectation that based on the things that Ruth pointed out, you know, the statistics that Ruth pointed out, is that if you have two equal CVs, you want to look at them equally and you want to make sure that actually you're picking people for the right reasons and not because male candidates are getting some sort of implicit bias bump in your head that makes their identical CV actually more attractive. So I, I, I don't like the idea of taking, because the last thing we want is women who are maybe not ready for a position, being given that position, not doing as well as they could do, and then everyone's saying, well, there's a reason women don't get promoted, because they're not very good. And actually what you want to do is just challenge your expectations of what a good candidate looks like, and make sure that you're always picking people based on the fact that you know you have this implicit bias. We had Cheryl. Okay. I wanted to ask a question about uh, implicit bias because that's been mentioned a lot and this is purely from my anecdotal experience but I've actually often had the feeling that it is quite explicit and that it is quite open that a lot of people know about it and nothing is really done about it. So I wanted to hear some and this is mainly from the academic side. I had the feeling from my personal, very limited experience in the industry that was a little bit more hidden, but maybe you could comment on that. I think you're right. I think, well, it depends. I think some people know what not to say and some people don't. I've encountered both. Um, I, I, I think actually, I have to say, I think, in terms of gender, people know what not to say. I think there are other characteristics, um, um, LGBT status, for example, race um, and nationality and things like that, where people are not as careful, or as careful and are quite explicit and really just not acceptable. And I think actually those are the way where it's even worse, actually. So I, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I think there are times when the implicit bias sort of rears its ugly head and we all get to see just what you people really think. But actually, I know from my perspective that I'm as guilty as, of the implicit part as, as anybody else. So I edit a journal and I have to send papers out to, to reviewers and I have to fill in a form for each reviewer and I have to put their professional title. And I realised after about a year of doing this that I was automatically putting professor for the men and doctor for the women. And I sort of found myself in my office going, what on earth are you doing? So I now always check. I always check. And if a bloke hasn't earned the title professor, I will call him doctor, because that's his title. But I will make sure that I give women their proper professional titles. And that's me coming at it from a fairly extensive knowledge of gender issues and science. And even I can you know, still do it. So we're all absolutely guilty of it. And we all have these inbuilt things that we can't help. But what we can do is be really aware of them and then like I said before, constantly question ourselves of why am I making this decision? Why am I thinking this? Is there a way, is my bias showing here? Um, we'll take one more question for this. Is there one? Not, not so much a question, but an observation. I, I, I'm, I work for BA Systems, big organisation, 88,000, a bit similar to Rolls Royce. But I'm in a, 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 an interesting part of BA Systems um, that has a strong consulting part of the organisation. So we do have a distinction between people on the consulting side and the engineering side. On the consulting side, a lot more diversity, a lot more women. About a thousand, not women, but a thousand in the organisation. There's a number of women in that. And your microphone's turned off. Is it? Oh, yeah, it's better, yeah. Um, and and, and we, have the, we have unconscious bias training, we have EDI. It's one of our top three objectives for our divisional directors. So that's good. Where I'm seeing the changes are happening are in promotion boards. So I've been on promotion boards uh, as a as a you know the advisor, and a lot more women are getting promoted. Uh, in our consulting led organisation, 45% of our staff are in their 20s, 35% in their 30s, 15% um, in their 40s, only 10% in their 50s and above. So we've got a young organisation. They the our young in our organisation, our 20 somethings, whether men or women demand EDI, actually demand it. And because they demand it, and we don't want to lose them, because we want to get the best people to retain, um, it has gone all the way up the chain, and it's influenced uh, director level you know, issues. 
So I'm seeing change, but I think it's, I wouldn't say it's across VA systems as a whole, you know, bigger organisation, but certainly in a consulting led with lots of young people, they demand uh, more um, EDI across the It's a comment rather than a question. So, I guess we'll move on to the next question on our slides, which is, how can women start networking better? How do you approach as if you're the only woman or person of colour or LGBT plus person in the room? I think my answer for this one is quite simple. I think it's all about building rapport. And if you say, what happens if you're the only woman in the room, that's like, for me, it's most of the time. So um, sometimes you see that, you know, when you, Sometimes you see the common topics coming up, like football, cars, and things like that. Um, and it's just a way of finding common ground for people, you know, regardless of the gender, to talk about something in common. So for me, it's finding that common theme. If I'm going to a conference, the common theme, of course, can bring up the topic and share experiences. And quite naturally, you start to build rapport and extend the network. So that's my experience. After a few minutes, when, when you've actually got to the point where you're actually having a conversation, um, usually that most of the time turns around. So I don't know if this is like a good um, advice, but somehow kind of like you know, stay stay strong and like just just get to the point where you're comfortable to be yourself, and and, and most people uh, will, will see that and, and then just see you for, for what you're saying. Carmen's advice is the advice I wish I'd given myself ten years ago to keep on persisting because it's true. If you, if if you, if people sort of just dismiss you, if you keep keep on talking to them, then eventually they'll come around. It's true. Yeah. And it may come as no surprise uh, to many of you in the audience that I used to do a lot of acting when I was younger. Um, so I have a long and checkered career of amateur dramatics and actually what I do for networking, because despite the fact that I'm tall, loud, quite confident and generally can do networking fairly well, it hasn't come naturally to me. I've, I've had to work at it. And so I treat it very much like I would treat doing something in acting, which is I practice. And so I practice how, how will I introduce myself? What will my opening line be? Make that kind of first step. You can try it out on people you know, you can try it out with your friends, they don't need to know you're doing it, but actually we're all quite used to kind of going up and talking to people, but practice, we can't, people sort of think that, that this idea of going up and talking to people should be something that we're all naturally good at, well we're not, you know, we all know people who are, but if you're not good at it, give yourself a break, you know, practice it the first couple of times, it'll be awful and you'll hate it and you'll feel really uncomfortable, but you'll learn and it'll get easier. So don't expect to be brilliant at networking as soon as you step into a conference. Work at it and before you know it, you will get better at it and you'll learn how to introduce yourself. And you'll learn, you know, the first time you give a talk, you learn your first couple of lines on your slide, right, because you don't know what your mouth's going to do when you stand up there. And so you make sure you have something you know what you're going to be able to say. Do the same with networking. Have a, have a strategy for it. Never go up not knowing what you're going to say to somebody. And then it will get easier. <laughs> so, sounds almost like an elevator pitch when you put it like that, Anella. Oh, what, sorry? Elevator pitch. Yeah. 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 Just, yeah, work on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very anecdotal again, but as I've gone through university and masters, I find that my female friends are much less self-assured and much less believing in their own ability when they often like is far beyond what the men are because of the climate that's created. What do you think is the best way to that related to networking well to instill that sort of arrogance that men often have? <laughs> I think I I agree with you. I see that happening to my friends as well. And I think we talk a lot about like implicit bias. I mean, this is this is where it comes in when 
you, you're the only woman walked into the room, try to talk, and suddenly that there's no response, that you can't really build a consensus, you can't really get the conversation going. That hurts your confidence. It happens again and again and again. It hurts your confidence. It's not because this person is not good enough. She's equally as good as anybody in the room, but because of things like that, it, it, it just perpetuates um, the confidence in women. So I agree with the observation. I think for me, it is, that, well, we need to talk about it. Like we talk about it to so raise awareness. So people can know it's not them, like don't blame yourself. It is, it is the environment and we need to change that. So this is my take on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, Go I think also don't um, forget that um, you know all, all all the men here as well can play their part. If you notice that somebody's being talked over, then you can say, "Oh, hang on, if that person's got something to say," or "I didn't quite get what you said," or um, just there are gentle ways of intervening um, to help help just make sure their voices are heard, and that that's that's a way of of giving them the space to talk, and that will give them confidence. I'm, I'm always a big advocate of the fact that you know women don't need fixing. <laughs> we're, we're, you know, the, the fact that, that we're talked over, it's that's not our problem. It's it's actually the system is screwed, right? So it's the system that needs to change, and actually everyone can play a part in changing that. And exactly like we said, and also the fact this idea that if you get a buy-in, exactly like you said, at a higher level, and it becomes really important, then that system will shift. Um, but the idea that you know, it's it's somehow that we're broken and that, you know, our lack of confidence is a problem. It isn't. There was, there was an amazing study um, done uh, about, about six weeks ago, it was in the news, where it said about um, me, women use less um, enthusiastic and effusive words to describe their research and grant proposals. And every media organisation described it as women use, you know, less kind of, you know, use this underconfident language. No one of them described it as men bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, is, you know, can we not flip it and say, well, actually, is it not that women are being perfectly truthful here about their work and being quite candid about what they can do and the men are just making it up? Um, and, and, and until we get that shift in perspective, I, I think that's what we really need to tackle. <laughs> so I comment. Um, um, uh, I think it's that's to do with with credibility also, right? Because like men can can afford to bullshit uh, sometimes, and and they'll still be credible with it. Whereas I think that sometimes we tone it down, you know, we keep it kind of serious because that's the way that it's credible. I just wanted to add something that's related to that. So there's this thing called imposter syndrome, and it's something that I experience like quite intensely. And I'll do things like before I say anything, I'll apologise, and I say like uh, this is going to be a really silly question. And I say like uh, before I show someone my work, I'm like, and I, I know it's not very good, and it's not done yet, and all of this. And I have some wonderful co-workers who, because they're aware of it, they notice it and they tell me all the time, you just said, you just apologised for nothing, stop doing that. And um, they make me aware when I'm doing it. So I think that's something that you can do. Very good comment, but at the same time, don't you feel that a lot of men have the imposter syndrome as well? And I have had so many of my friends coming to me and trying to ask a question, starting with, oh, sorry, this is a silly question, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's the imposter syndrome is real and it happens to everyone in the industry and in the academia. Yeah. Okay. I, I would say that it's not just limited to women, obviously, like there are a lot of other people that feel it, but I think that 
my gender does tie in somewhat to why I feel it. But I think it's not the only reason anyone would feel imposter syndrome. Yeah. Okay, we've got a question at the back, I think, and then person in the front, middle here. Um, so it seems like one way to fix this problem is um, that's now disappeared <laughs> is to ensure, if we can, that uh, <laughs> I don't the problem is solved. I smart. did it. <laughs> there we go. Um, Just go move the mouse every once in a while. <laughs> one way to fix this problem is to ensure uh, as much as possible that you're not the only woman in the room, right? Um, so diversity is good for everyone, and I think some people realise that more than others. Um, for instance, like at undergraduate level, walking into a lecture hall and there's five uh, girls and 190 guys, uh, that's not something that you want to see as a man either. So I guess at companies like OQC where I work, we always show the picture of the team, be clear to show like the diverse uh, group of people we have working for us and you hope that that means that people will apply because they see that and that's something they value, right, men or, or women. So at events and conferences like this, do you think it's important to um, maybe even advertise or communicate beforehand, like, look, this is a conference where we're talking about inclusion um, and there are going to be, we, we've made sure that the attendance will be more fair um, to try and kind of attract people who see this as valuable. There's been an awful lot of work around that, exactly what you're talking about in things like the way we phrase job adverts. And so about the language we use about making that language so that everybody feels like they have um, that, that that's a place where they'll belong, where they'll because that's all we ever want to do is we just want to go somewhere and feel like we belong there. And so uh, changing the language around how we do things like job adverts, um, sort of adding phrases like we particularly strongly encourage applications from early career women, scientists of colour, etc. And actually really kind of saying, you know, we want you here, you are part of this, and sort of reminding them that, you know, we, we see you and, and you're part of, of, of our, our team in a way. Um, and the other thing about conferences that's apparently made, made a huge difference as well is having um, a transparent and easily available code of conduct. So actually having an explicit code of conduct that people can download that sets out the expectations of how everybody in that conference will behave. And that can make a huge difference to people feeling safe uh, in attending that conference, whether they're female, whether they're LGBT, whether they're black. It really can actually encourage people to want to take part. So it's something I always encourage people to consider. And physics has actually now got a departmental code of conduct that covers exactly that. Uh, we've had one more question. Um, in terms of what you guys are saying about imposter syndrome and um, men also having imposter syndrome, I think the thing about EDI, the reason why we don't hear so much about men having imposter syndrome is because there isn't as much focus on mental health and I really don't think EDI can succeed without coupling it together with mental health and especially in academia, it's a massive misnomer that women, <laughs> they can also curb empowerment of women, and men can also do that to men. And I think pushing that agenda in terms of empowering men to talk about what they struggle with will give greater empathy on both parts. Um, and I mean, like, I don't know if it's like a case by case situation, but I went to to my university thinking there would be a sisterhood in terms of like the, the females and because of the system I think it just messed with everyone's head so much that we became so much more insular and it wasn't a sisterhood at all if anything the women were more competitive against the women and not their male compatriots at all so yeah and I think it's it's to like encourage both parties to Talk about everything. Just keep talking. Um, do we want to? Anyone want to provide any comments on that? 
So. Yeah, it sounded like we were very much in agreement there. <laughs> okay, so we'll move on to the next question, which is, what are good ways of dealing with harassment or discrimination in your workplace, and who should you reach out to if you experience it or see someone experience it? Um, I'd like to say uh, there's a very simple solution. Um, um, sometimes it can be very difficult to deal with these situations because you're dealing with somebody often that you might be working with every day, for example, or it might be somebody in the wider community who's very senior and well known. Um, and it can be then difficult to um, be taken seriously, but the first thing you do is make a. I, I think a lot of women don't take it themselves as seriously, first of all, as they should. Um, I remember as a, as a you know a PhD student, a junior academic, a lot of stuff happening to me and just thinking, okay, this is normal, I've just got to put up with it. And I look back and think, my God, it was really bad. It, and even my, you know, my, my, my former kind of cohort of PhD students said, we were really bad, weren't we? I went, mean, yeah, you were. <laughs> um, and, you know, all sorts of stuff happened. Um, and I, I think actually taking yourself seriously is the most important thing and then you can make a decision about whether you um, report it um, and I would say go to, not necessarily to your supervisor, but to um, HR if you're staff or if you're um, a student, go to, um, there'll be a designated person you can go to within the department, okay, and make sure that, that it's taken seriously. Um, it's also good to talk to somebody probably senior and female that you trust because they like, like as we have seen they have probably been through it before and know what other people's happened to them can help and provide more support I hope. Just agree with that and I think um, you and from the, the people at the top, it must be zero tolerance. That, yeah, nothing else will be, no. I agree with that. I think the first thing is to not silence yourself, like you said. Um, and there are multiple ways, I'm sure, like in universities or in companies, there's always an anonymous helpline or an ethics line, things like that, that somebody can call. Sometimes people are not sure whether that's um, you know something they want to bring up or not, but bringing that up in you know whether it's helplines or talking to people doesn't mean that you, you have to press charges or things like that. You know, in the first the, I'll say the first action is to start talking about it, and then you can always discuss with uh, mentors or, or even even an anonymous helpline. So that's it for me. So um, maybe I'm looking for comment as well, but I think codes of conduct go a long way to stopping this happening in the first place, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think it's, so one of the things as I get sort of, you know, older and start to look at what my students are experiencing, the more I kind of get quite activated about things like this. So I think there are informal ways of reporting um, discrimination and harassment, and I think they're great, but I think if you work somewhere where there isn't a really obvious formal way of doing it, you need to start making a noise about that and say, we demand that there is a transparent method to report this. It has to be written somewhere where everyone can see it and everyone should sign up to it. So we're quite lucky at Bristol that we have uh, appropriate behaviour advisors who you can go and talk to if you're not sure about how to do this. I've gone on behalf of other people who've reported things to me and I've said, how would we deal with this situation? And they've given us guidelines and it's been really useful. There are online reporting tools. They were started at the University of Cambridge a few years ago where you can anonymously report um, and you don't have to give your name. Of course, that has pros and cons. Um, but there are also formal reporting processes. If you do happen to end up working somewhere that doesn't have that, I think it's the kind of thing that you can, you know, you, you can really actually make a huge change in an organisation by saying, look, this is what we need for the benefit of everybody. Because it isn't just the women you know, men are bullied as well, um, LGBT people are, are at risk of bullying as well, and actually having a process that everybody goes, look, you know what it is, that can actually really help. 
any questions for me? And if you're and if you're a guy, you can demand those things as well. It doesn't have to be the women. Please, please do it. We'll listen to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so often, I think it's quite easy to downplay micro, downplay these kind of instances of harassment and discrimination that and think that it's not quite worthy of reporting. You know, things like microaggression and or yeah, other kind of issue is how do you kind of at what point should people start reporting that at what point should people start reporting that, that kind of behavior and how do you advise people on that on like the point at which you start trying to report it or raise it or speak with someone about it any thoughts I think that's a tough one because I think people, everybody has a different breaking point. So everybody, so for some people, because of their past experiences or, or how they're feeling at the time or their mental health, they might not actually, you know, they, they, they can feel, start to feel very uncomfortable in the situation, maybe earlier than other people would do. That doesn't make either situation right or wrong. Um, and I think it's, it's a really hard one to answer because it's only when I look back over, you know, I started university at, 19 and I look back over over kind of that many years and kind of go god I'm exhausted and when I add up all of the different tiny tiny little fractional things the comments and 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 the things that people probably didn't even think would be hurtful or things that actually were, were quite painful to hear it's when you add it up and you kind of go at what point should I have stopped that because I I don't even know for me so I think it's being very aware of yourself and being aware of what makes you feel uncomfortable and when you feel actually, do you know what, that's enough for me now. That's, I think, if you can do yourself that favour of knowing yourself well enough, knowing where your boundaries are, then um, you'll know when to step in. Don't leave it till, you know, if you actually start thinking maybe I should report this, you've probably hit the point where you should report it. Any further points on that? Sorry? Well, just, just comment on this, I think this is where um, you can be a good ally very early, uh, on very subtle points you can just, you know, if you see something happening, a colleague saying, saying a compliment to someone else might be offensive or, or annoying, you can just you know, <coughs> nicely say to that colleague in private and take it on yourself. So, Dean, you had a question? Um, so there exists a really good uh, report which was published by the UKRI, I think, last year or two years ago, about harassment at UK universities, and they, did, they discussed in quite details um, something they call research superstars. So they said quite often you have the situation at universities and the way of how universities work and how you bring the um, overhead fees to the schools. They had like these um, research superstars that brought in a lot of money and they clearly identified in their report whenever there was a problem with such a person and someone reported harassment or, the, or discrimination by this person, usually it ended up um, the person that had reported it either left the university or they never made it public because um, they also found out that universities um, excessively used NDAs. And I, I personally encountered quite often situations where you talk with men about such stories and they always say, well, you can't judge this person. Nothing is official. He was not officially found guilty because it obviously never made this entire process never made it to a stage where um, someone found to be guilty. So do you really think the, the system has everything in place that you can really say, I can go to HR or someone senior and I can report this? wish it was everything was fair and above board in university and other employers did what they're supposed to do. Um, I think the only way to fight that is 
working together and making employers realize that the bad publicity from people finally being found out is much, much worse than losing a superstar. I mean, there have been instances where very, very big stars have fallen, like Jeff Macy, for example, is a good one. Um, um, and, you know, it's not an easy one to answer. I think it's, there is a lot of institutional bias, and I think, I think also because there are a lot of, to be honest, there are a lot of men at the top who kind of think, <coughs> ah, it's not that bad. You know, um, it doesn't really matter that much. Yeah, I don't have a good answer, I'm afraid. It's not a good answer and it's not an ideal answer, but I would like to hope that the changes that are being implemented now will mean that the people who are running universities and who are in these positions of power to make these decisions to get rid of serial harassers, no matter how much money they bring in, if we have people now who are aware of these issues in 10 years' time when they're in charge, maybe they will make better decisions because at the moment we're dealing with a legacy of people who didn't grow up in a culture where unconscious bias training was a thing and considering gender balance was a thing. When we do maybe have you know, more women, more ally men in positions of power, then, then I think the system has a chance of being able to turn around and say, I don't care what your grant income is. Yeah, that's not how we behave here, you're gone. Will it happen in the next two years, five years? I don't think so, but will it happen? I think it might. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to concur with that um, last point. So I'm a part-time master's student, uh, so I work for a big listed company in the finance sector as well. And I find that it's quite surprising because in the private sector, I, swear, I think things have come on leaps and bounds. and. It's quite surprising coming back to university and hearing, speaking to female PhD students and hearing about all these kind of like stories about sexual harassment. And even though in a university it seems as though um, education seems to be even more prevalent than in the private sector. And I think what, you know, this will concur with what you're saying, it seems to be about the fact that in the private sector there are heavy and swift consequences that come straight down on people who, um, particularly male people um, in positions of like man power or management, etc. I just wanted to ask, like, what route do you see there being to implementing that kind of zero tolerance like culture um, in the um, academic world, which I think you know the private sector, and particularly large sort of publicly listed companies, have implemented quite effectively in the recent years. Put me and Ruth in charge. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have to say, I think the reason that companies are much better at dealing with it, because they understand the consequences of bad publicity much better. I think it's very nice to think that we might have better people in charge in the future, but people are always swayed by money. Um, the thing that's, which really um, um, got rid of with Jeff Marcy, this, um, a, a serial kind of harasser in the astronomy community, was the fact that when the People being harassed, the women being harassed, complained to the university, nothing happened. They went to BuzzFeed. And BuzzFeed met, basically, it exploded on the internet and then they, it made such bad publicity for the university, they could do nothing about it. And it, you, you've seen it also with more high profile cases of her, serial harassers. And it's now becoming, things are hopefully changing. But again, I hope that the university isn't immune to those changes. Any comments from Yingo Carmen? Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, so we'll move on then. Um, so we've already covered, talked about this next question a bit, but just to make it bring us explicitly into the conversation, how can we bring men along in the gender equality and diversity push? <laughs> so maybe I can mention some of the things I've tried. Yeah. Um, so, um, as part of this cost action, what, what I would do is run discussion sessions about specific topics, and it would things like, should we have positive discrimination or affirmative action? What do we do about our sexual harassment? And what I would do, actually, is divide the room, in fact, in, um, into down gender lines, sometimes seniority lines as well. So, separate the men and the women into two separate discussion groups, and actually move them to a different room sometimes. Um, 
and um, get them to discuss the topic separately. And first of all, people were quite against that. They said it's very sexist to sort of name people and divide people. But actually, what you find is that the discussions are very different down gender lines. And it's the those discussions, and in particular, it's also important for discussions to happen, especially in female only circles, but also in male only circles, because of course, this topic of say, for example, sexual harassment, is something which will also cause a lot of fear among men that they'll be doing the wrong thing. And they need to actually express those fears and, and to discuss what they think is the right thing and the wrong thing, okay? The most important thing is to come together again and have representatives from those two groups discuss the differences and the answers. Now, I've done this, it, I think it sort of partly works. Um, and I combine that with, say, presenting some statistics. And actually, I did find that, especially the senior men, actually across the board, several, you know, I got a lot of people coming to me and saying this has really changed my mind. Uh, but I think you, you really do need to engage men in discussion and let them have free voice as well to say what they think about these subjects, not just tell them what they should be thinking. I think that the most effective way of, of getting men on board is, is to have them experience how much better it is to work in groups where they have to take about it. Like it, it is just it is just different. noticeable and, and um, people will realize quite quickly and that's that's easier to do perhaps in, a, in a, an industry setting and actually um, last night uh, someone said that to me so I was in this uh, CEO event and it, we were three in the discussion there was a, a male CEO and then myself and another female CEO and the, and the guy said to both of us if I can give you any advice it's so that tells you that uh, A, he's quite patronizing, but uh, also that uh, it is true. It's, it is better. You can see teams working better. I think I've got, um, I've got a lot of thoughts on this one. Um, because I think gender equality is good for everyone. It's not just good for women, it's good for men too. And toxic masculinity hurts men. I think if we can achieve gender equality as a society, both men and women are freer to make choices. That is my take on it, in short. Yeah, I think to add to that, if you can't have a gender diverse group, why not? look to try to make your group as diverse in other ways, even if it means making sure that everybody can be their true self when they come to work. Mm. Don't, put, don't impose a particular type of personality mm. on, onto your group. I mean, you see some groups which are like little personality cults, cults which is, you know, can be very off-putting if you don't think you belong. And just a small addition to that, it, it really matters, like, the actual, like, smaller groups, like the subgroups where people the people that people spend their day actually working with, it's not enough to look at the overall department or, or even uh, research group. It's, it's the subgroup that, that it has to be uh, diverse to that level. It's quite easy sometimes to want when particularly when you spent a lot of your career thinking about things like this and thinking about the impact that decision making has on women particularly <coughs> when you are a woman and when you've built up a knowledge of the the statistics and the research that's been done and you know god knows i've read the papers and it's quite easy sometimes to hector people and to kind of go no it should be like this no you're, you don't understand and i'm right and and, and actually a dialogue is much more important let people say well you know i don't understand why we need to do this and so allow them to have their opinion and allow and be gentle about it you know it, sometimes i am exhausted and i just want to go for god's sake i know what i'm talking about like please listen to me but actually we all know what it's like to be talked to like that so actually now the tables have turned and really it's allowing people to have a conversation that's open and honest and allows them to understand why this is important for them as well as for you just to, if i want something to add to that um um, what I found in having discussions in this cost action was that there's a community of, of let's say, men at the sort of postdoc level in particular 
who are also very fearful about their careers and what they see is a kind of this that the women are getting all the help and they are not and they feel quite resentful um, and I can see that the comment maybe about yes hire women is, is, is okay that's maybe the comment should be hire a diverse workforce but men see that and go well, you know, you've got all these women with the social skills and everything, and they, they you know, and, and like um, all these different, you know, they're much better at so many things. I'm good at something technical, and like, I'm, but I don't have all these other attributes. How am I going to make it? And I see quite a lot of that, actually. A lot of, a lot of fear among men, and yes, there's imposter syndrome among men as well. They might cover it up by overconfidence, but in general, that it's, 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 Sometimes the academia at that level can be quite difficult for everybody, and we have to bear that in mind. Question regarding what Ruth just said about um, the men on postdoc level that feel like a bit excluded because they see women getting favored or a stronger su support. I was wondering, so in my experience, these men quite often also do not see the hurdles you have to jump as a woman are so much higher. And do you, I don't know, is this something you across the panel? experience in a similar way and do you think there's a good way of um, raising more awareness in in these men? So one thing I would say is that um, yes we should be raising awareness um, and that goes part way to help but don't forget sometimes there are let's say um, um, hidden disadvantages for some men as well um, that you know, at least if you're a woman, people are beginning to notice that you have disadvantages. There are some groups in society um, who are also at disadvantage if you're, let's say, in this country working class, you're at a st strong disadvantage as well. Um, and it's much more difficult to actually say why that is and to, to monitor it. Um, and, and, or, you know, there could be many different things that men are experiencing as well. So you just have to be a little bit careful, I think, and just listen to each other. Or, or because they just they had a, a boss that was particularly bad, and um, I've seen those men react really badly at um, posters about the Women's Society in Physics, for example, reacting like why why do you why do you get a group to support network like why why do you have this club and I don't know anything. so it, instead of like the people that feel excluded coming together. Just to reinforce this point that it's all about listening in conversation. There are I, I've spoken to a lot of men who, whether out of frustration or out of worry about doing the wrong thing, have checked out and often don't speak to women or will not go up and talk to a woman because they don't want to impinge upon her experience or do something wrong. And I think that's really counterproductive. And it's because we're not having nuanced conversations, we're not talking about the details and how we feel about these issues. I think it's just big picture, which doesn't really help. So yeah, that careful, considered conversation, I think, is central to these issues. Um, just because we've been talking about this whole time, um, empathy like breeds empathy. And I feel there's one thing, 
I guess I feel like I'm quite lucky to have grown up in this generation. Maybe it's because of the people that I surround myself with or like minds attract each other, but the men in my generation that I find are way more to for empowering women uh, and empower because they themselves feel like they're part of the conversation and they are feeling empowered to talk about their, I guess, feelings um, and their, their mental health and whatever. But I think the reason why it's so we're so indifferent to it in this side of academia is because the human element of STEM, it, we're kind of divided from it because, you know, we're, we're technical people. And as much as it's important to have Newtonian mechanics as a, a core subject, and it's like, don't get me wrong, I was a student <laughs> not so long ago, as, and whatever your inclination towards exams, we don't want another one. But I think the payoff for getting people to write essays about EDI, about mental health, and incorporating and how that can be incorporated into STEM will really help <laughs> embed that into people's thinking, into people's rhetoric, and then it's, it's, if you, generally, if you repeat something enough, it becomes part of you. And if they hear it throughout their entire undergraduate career, then maybe we can embed it into, into academia. In, in the, in, sorry, in the interest of time, um, is it okay if we, like the panelists give their last points on this one and we move on to the final question? Sorry, <laughs> sorry I, there's a lot of people who want, want in on this. There, Bear in mind, we have an entire lunch break after this for you to chat with the panelists more about this, these issues. Um, so yeah, any last final points on this? Oh, that's just your work. That's your work. But that's what matters, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Listening to that one person is important. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay, so we'll move on to the final question, which is how can women support each other during their studies or in the workplace? If you are a leader within your group or organisation, what steps have you taken towards this? Or if not, um, what have you met, pushed for or done on a kind of more daily basis to kind of better support women or other minorities? Um, so within our Centre for Doctoral Training, I've been really proud that over the last 10 years, um, we've got a 50-50 gender balance. Now, don't ask me how we've managed that. Except keep asking me how we've managed that. I'm like, I don't know. Um, but one of the things that I do think that I've tried to work on really hard is making our CDT a place where everybody feels they belong, they're safe, and that they have all the tools available to make them the absolute best at whatever they want to be when they finish their PhD. Um, and so I have started doing, at the start of every year, a little kind of a little talk about my, my expectations of me and how I will behave and what I will provide and the support that I will offer. And then I counter that with, and in return, I would like this, the following things from you as a cohort. And those things include respect for everybody that you work with, regardless of gender, ethnicity, religion or lack thereof, sexual orientation, gender presentation, like everyone will be treated equally and we have a zero tolerance policy for anything that goes against that. People know that they can come to me and people know exactly what my response will be if anything is reported to me. So. Um, it's about setting out the stall really, really early and telling people this is a place where everybody is equal and everyone has an equal say. Because I realised that we were kind of doing it, sort of not explicitly, but actually there were a couple of incidents where I thought it's really worth hammering home to people that we, we, we all belong here and we, all feel, we should all feel safe here and we should all feel like this is a place where 
good things get done and that when bad things happen, you've got support. And I don't regret for a second having done that. And you know, occasionally in the first year, people come in and I'm like, I'm a PhD student, don't need to hear any of this, and they'll kind of roll their eyes a bit. But actually, people do buy into it, and I think it's created a culture where people feel like they can they can speak up. I hope so. Anyway, that's if, if there's one thing I could leave the kind of CBT journey having done, I think that would be it. I think um, in, in a lot of companies now, it's in industry, we have some sort of gender diversity <coughs> group or maybe like women um, sort of club that we've mentioned together. Um, that is a way of supporting women. So a lot of them, so speaking from my own experience, when I first started out, um, things that we talk about, you know, being talked over, being interrupted, initially, I think a lot of people might internalise that and think, well, that's just me. But once you put two women together or a couple of women together and you start sharing the experience, all of a sudden it's not about just, it's not my problem, it's not just my problem. It is, you know, you start to realise a, a lot of you know, all this discrimination as a whole. And I think that is a starting point to first recognise that. And then, you know, if you put a group of people together, they can start thinking about next steps, you can think about action plans, they can talk, they can get mentoring, they can get sponsorship from senior senior uh, management to push through um, a, a lot of these diversity initiatives. So I think that's, that's my take on it. Um, I, I think that's what I would say. I think that Yeah, I was thinking about this um, this question. Um, I don't think I do anything um, explicitly in terms of gender. What I try to do, though, in my group is just, um, just and also when I'm at conferences as well, try to, to talk to PhD students and postdocs and just, just listen to what they've got to say and, and find out what's going on with them, be in listening mode a bit, and just try to make it clear that Everybody can have their own personality. Everybody should be expressing themselves and being, you know, that there isn't one way you have to be. So I, I feel personally that in some fields there's a kind of almost a sort of cult-like thing. If you've got to be this kind of person to succeed, you've got to be very alpha male. You've got to be like this. I mean, you know, um, like Silicon Valley is totally like that. And my worry about quantum is that it does feel a little bit, a bit like that sometimes in a way that. I mean, I came from semiconductor physics generally more, and it wasn't like that in semiconductor physics, but it is in the quantum area a lot more, and I'm a bit worried about quantum because it does have a little bit this Silicon Valley vibe to it, and that normally comes and goes along with a particular type of personality, and I'm worried about that a little bit. So I'm, I'd like everyone to get the message that they can just be themselves, and they don't have to be this, you know, alpha male flashy kind of person to be a success. Um, I'd like to mention something that Ruth actually touched upon in your, in your talk at the beginning about the importance of mentoring um, and the importance of having role models and people to kind of um, I guess support you. Um, one, pa uh, one question I had for the panel and Alex was, um, have you had any um, particular mentors um, in your career, um, and also um, as as there are um, as there's this this problem with um, gender balance um, in a higher career stage, um, I wonder if part of solving the issue is actually mentoring up, 
and um, mentoring those to be mentors. Um, and I wondered if you had um, any um, advice um, or um, experience in that, in, in mentoring um, others to mentor. So to the second part of the question, no, I, I've never, it's a brilliant idea, um, but it's not something that um, I've had any experience of. In terms of formal mentoring, um, I've had one formal mentor, it's a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. If you don't get the right person, I mean, it, you might, it's, it's actually, it can be damaging. Um, this person wasn't a bad person, but we just didn't click at all. And um, I didn't feel that they were listening to me. Um, and I was telling them quite specific things, and they kept kind of coming back to something that I wasn't talking about. And, frustrated me. There's been two people in my career who I think have had the biggest impact on me. Um, one is my fellowship supervisor in the US, mainly because from him I learnt how I would never ever run my group. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 was, it was an absolute masterclass in what not to do. Um, it really was. I came back from that going, if I'm ever in the position where I have my own PhD students, my god I will not treat them like that. It was, it was, I could tell horror stories about how that group functioned, it was horrendous. And then I moved from that into my first role in Bristol where my line manager was a man who was um, maybe 20 years older than me, and we just clicked. We just, we got each other. And he listened to me and he asked me what I needed and he asked me what I wanted. And it wasn't a perfect uh, line managing relationship, none of them ever are, but I felt so much empathy from him and so much support, and there is no way I would be in the position I am if he had not been my line manager. He was, and I don't even think he knew he was doing it most of the time, but he just got it. He was, he was really able to understand what I was frightened of, and what were my worries, and what did I want to achieve, and he just helped me. Um, and it felt really natural, and I think if you're ever going to get a mentor, don't be afraid if the first one doesn't work out, try again, because sometimes you do need to go through a few before you find the one who is right for you. And you'll know when you do, God, it sounds like dating advice, sorry. <laughs> um, but you will, and you and actually, and you'll realise, you'll realise when it's the right person uh, for your career at that, and your mental needs will change throughout your career. You'll need different things throughout your career, and different people will provide those. Yeah, thinking about what Anna had to say, I mean, I think I don't have, I've never had a mentor as such. Um, I think what you do is you build an informal mentor network of people who you go to for support um, of different kinds, emotional support, practical support, um, advice. Um, they probably don't know that they have that role in your life. And it's not always something like above you, it can be just um, just somebody who's like um, at the same level as you or even somebody below you even. <coughs> That, that they, they might have a particular role in one particular thing. Um, so I think that's much more important to build a support network than it is to find a mentor. Mentoring uh, between women, uh, there's a few uh, considerations. I think it's so important for, for women to support each other, and there's you know there's nothing more upsetting than some a woman higher up in your field not truly seeing you. Uh, I think that's quite hurtful. On the other hand, I feel like we do a lot of uh, care and support work, and sometimes you know I understand that some women just don't want to, don't feel like it, um, and also don't really feel like they know how to respond back to you. Um, so, I'm li listening to your experience, I'm actually, I think I'm really lucky because I had so many mentors in my five years of my career. So I, well, 
I was really lucky because I get into the graduate scheme where they assign some mentors for you. They've got professional mentor who help me through chartership to become a chartered engineer. And I have career mentors who help you with, you know, what you want to do, what are your strengths, how do you plan your career and things like that. And over multiple years, I have personally reached out to people as well to ask them to be my career, uh, careers with my, my mentor. Um, and if I think about it, actually most of them are men. Um, just because in industry, it, I mean, just because of the proportion, I've not, not got the chance to see a lot of, um, sort of female, sort of senior managers in, in my career yet. Recently, I've got a lot more, and that's really, a, and it's, it's sort of another day. It's actually quite interesting, you know, like you start to share a lot of things about being women in engineering industry, um, which sometimes it doesn't come naturally when you have a, have a male mentor. So with, my, with this one mentor that I had, um, he was my mentor from the first day I started uh, at work, uh, coaching me through chartership. We didn't talk anything about being, you know, female in engineering at all in my first year. It was purely work, you know, how we create reports for the professional institutions, how we go through all of these things. After five years, I don't know how, he's, he's now a feminist. <laughs> <laughs> he openly advocates for more women in engineering. I don't know what happened, but I think, I mean, initially it was more, I ask for advice from him, but towards the end, or at, at the moment, it's more, it's two ways. So I will provide my perspective, and he will provide his. And sometimes I just need a sounding board for something. It's not necessarily an advice that I will have to go and follow, it's not an instruction. I just, let's say I've got a presentation for something, I say, well, you know, I just need somebody 10 minutes, let's have coffee, I'll talk about what, I, uh, what I'm gonna talk about, and maybe you can give me uh, give some feedback, what do you think? And I don't always take all this advice, and it was quite clear in, in this whole mentorship relationship. Um, and, and I find that quite um, empowering, I think, so it's, it's both ways. I, I would like to think that it's influencing in some ways, um, having a young female engineer uh, in a company gives them a different perspective. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess one of the things I can potentially add to that is I've had mentors across different aspects of my life as well. So obviously I've had mentors on the academic side and the industrial side who have done some great support great work there. I've also had um, personal mentors on other issues as well, such as as an LGBTQ plus person, as in the people who like helps guide me through that. As and for that, I'm extremely grateful to them as well. Oh. And so yeah, it's similar to what I think it was Ruth or Carmen said about having not just a single mentor but a kind of network of people who can support you and help raise you up, up is a very beneficial thing. Um, we're going to quickly move on to the last, the final point now which is there's obviously there's a lot of masters and PhD students in this room and today, what would, when, what would our panelists give as like a single take home advice to themselves when they, if they had the chance to speak with themselves at that stage? I think for me, um, one thing I'd say to my younger self is be the change you want to see. So the world is not perfect, and I think when I was a lot younger, I was a bit hurt by how sometimes it's a bit, there's a bit of injustice and unequal uh, stuff that's happening in the world. But I think instead of feeling that, um, turn that into action, and yeah, and, and do what you can and to make the world a better place. Um, I thought of something and I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I was, but I think it was, uh, which sounds really cheesy, but like, be yourself, like um, if you can somehow find the strength to, to be your natural self and not try to like adapt to um, the way that you think other people, um, what other people want to see, uh, I think that's, that's a strong um, position and I think one can find self-confidence Like I said before, I think Carmen's tip of, of don't be put off if networking is hard, keep on going, and eventually uh, listen is, is a very good one. Is the kind of, but I think keep on going is good. Um, yeah, I think be yourself is good. Um, I was thinking about this. 
I think about what I would have done differently. Um, um, I think it's, part of me says I'm really happy with how, what happened in my life, and I don't want anything to. Didn't want. I wouldn't have gone down a different route. Then I think, well, you know, maybe I could have done some things different. Maybe not keep on joining all male groups, for example. Um, that would have made my life a bit easier. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I don't know if I could answer this question, I'm afraid. <laughs> I mean, my immediate thought was to tell my younger self, don't have a buzz cut when you're 20, it doesn't suit you, you don't have the right shape head for it. But no, in all seriousness, um, I spent most of my 30s paralysed with fear, um, absolutely terrified that my career was over and that I was never going to achieve what I'd kind of set out for myself when I'd first started my PhD. And I look back now and realise that what I wish I'd been able to say to myself is your journey to wherever you get to is yours. Don't compare yourself to other people. Um, whatever you're experiencing and whatever happens, go with it. It's right, you know, it's going to be right for you. You may not end up going to where you thought you were going to go. You may get to where you want to go, but you took a really weird route to get there. It's fine. Things rarely work out the way we expect them to, and it's about having that kind of bravery to kind of go, all right, well, you know, I'll just, I'll see how it works out. Um, you know, having a plan's great, but also being able to cope when the plan doesn't work out. So don't be scared if you don't know what you want to do, or don't be scared if you think you might be going in a slightly different direction. Just be you, and don't compare yourself, because it's all about what's right for you. And also be kind to people as well. <laughs> great. So. Um, thank you everyone for listening and can we give one last round of, of applause for our wonderful panelists. <laughs> I'm now going to hand back over to Frederica for some last notes before lunch. This all